Good morning and welcome. It is good when we can gather together to worship, to celebrate God's grace in our lives, in our world, and all around us. A couple of announcements. Also, we want to welcome those who are joining us by video. We are delighted that you're a part of our family as well. Uh, you'll notice there's purple boxes at the, each of the aisles. Those are for your offerings. And also, there should be a little slip of paper in your bulletin. If you'd please register your presence with us. If we have to get hold of everybody, we're able to. Also, we do use those for the prayer chain. And so if you have any prayer requests, please put it on there. And if it's just for me, hit private on the little box, and it just goes to me. And also, if it's not even a prayer, just something you want to communicate, that's probably not a bad way, because I do go through those each week, and they're part of my prayer practice. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite Nick for a word about salt and light. Good morning, church. Good morning. One more time. We can do better than that. One more time. Good morning, church. Good morning. There we go. I'm here to talk to us about salt and light. As many of you all know, that is our Wednesday after school program that we do throughout the school year. Uh, I wanted to let you know, first of all, that it resumes on Wednesday, September 4th. We're very excited for it. Uh, and I had three specific things that I wanted to uh, do today with regards to salt and light. Uh, the first is I would like to recognize all the folks that, that have or currently do volunteer with salt and light. Uh, many of us are wearing the, the blue shirts, but even if you're not, if you volunteer or have volunteered with salt and light, would you stand up and would you, could we recognize you? We also, some of us have been volunteering so long, we have the, the previous shirts, the purple ones. Love y'all. Uh, the, the second thing, I do want to remind you, there is still time to, to sign up to be a part of our kitchen crews. What that would look like is on Wednesdays, you would join in the kitchen in Watkins. You would help prepare and serve a meal for the children, uh, and you'd have a good amount of fun. It's usually about one Wednesday a month that we'd be looking for. Uh, I'll be harassing people during after worship fellowship, uh, getting them to sign up, so watch out for that. Uh, but with that, uh, the third thing, I'd like to um, really uh, hand it off to Reverend Story. Uh, we got a new director that I think we need to commission. Thank you all. Okay, Veronica, would you please join me in the front? She just disappeared. <laughs> Please join me. Now, you may recognize Veronica is our church secretary, and she's, well, there's been one problem with her taking over, is that she did so well that I forgot that she hasn't been doing it for a while. <laughs> uh, and because she's doing such a great job and is eager to take on more, she is going to be our new uh, uh, director of our Salt and Light program. And so we are delighted. And as a part of her service, I'd like us to commission her with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we do thank you for the grace you've shown this church. We thank you, Lord, that you've blessed us in so many ways. We ask, Lord, we'd continue to live into those blessings this would be a place where people, and especially children, are loved and cared for. We ask, Lord, that our Salt and Light program would minister to new people, administer to people that have been around. We ask, Lord, that it will make a difference in the lives of those who serve and those who are served. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Please strengthen and guide Veronica in this task. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and good luck. <laughs> Let us prepare for worship. There's a meditation at the beginning of our bulletin.
Please rise if you are able. Let us call ourselves to worship. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Because we have made the Lord our refuge, the Most High our dwelling place. No evil shall overcome us. No scourge come near our tent, for he will command his angels concerning us to guard in all our ways. Let us praise the Lord Most High. Our hymn of praise is number 263, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let us continue our worship with prayer. Most loving and compassionate God, spirit of truth and love, Jesus Christ, our salvation and hope, we come before you in adoration and joyful gratitude for the abundant blessings of our lives. Grant this day by the power of your spirit that we will hunger for truth and righteousness, 
illumine our hearts and minds and souls that we may better follow in the footsteps of Jesus and more worthily reflect and magnify your holy name. O oh Lord, may we in and through our worship move toward being more faithful, useful, and forgiving. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. According to the book of 1 John, if we claim that we are not sinners, then we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. But if we confess our sins, God is just and may be trusted to forgive our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Therefore, let us admit our sin using the prayer of confession and ask God to help us live more faithfully in the days ahead. Creator God, how rich and beautiful is this world you have made. We confess that we often forget to give you thanks, acting as though what we have is our own work and achievement. We consume the fruits of creation forgetting that you call us to bear fruit ourselves. We often do not share with others in the way you intend. We treat your generosity and blessings as our right and hold them possessively to ourselves. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to trust in you so deeply that we will stop worrying and share more freely with others, knowing that your grace and abundance will never run out. Amen. Having confessed our sin before God who loves us and saves us, let us walk anew. God calls us with a holy calling, not because of our good works, but because of God's own purpose in the grace of God given through Christ Jesus. Therefore, I declare to you that in Christ, all our sin has
has been forgiven. Through Jesus, we are loved and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. How does the Holy Spirit help us live faithful lives? In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks. Help us live holy and joyful lives even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that in the wife or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit Amen. Our hymn of assurance is number 468, In My Life, Lord. May I have the young disciples, please? Good morning. Settle down. How are we doing today? Good, right? I just want to quickly ask you, or any, if you know the answer, you can raise your hand. How many of you have been to the park with your parents? Okay. Was that fun? You had a lot of fun. You enjoy yourself in the park. What are the things that your parents told you when you see a stranger maybe in the park? Did you, what are they? Because they always give us some caution. Okay, what is it? Can any of you share with me what your parents told you about strangers or people you don't know? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good advice. What else did our parents tell us when we go to the park or maybe shopping mall? Yes. Don't talk to strangers. 
Don't talk to strangers. That's very, that resonates, right? We always hear that one. And the scripture that we are going to look at today is in Ephesians chapter 6. When I was like you guys, they made me master that scripture, okay? You must cram it. You know it without reading it from the Bible. You have to be able to read it without looking at the Bible. And verse 1 is very important. It says what? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. I like that uh, the ending part of it. It says, obey your parents in the what? In the Lord. And who are our parents in the Lord? Can you share with me who? Pastors, right? Our biological parents, our uncles, our teachers, even the government, right? When they ask us to do something, we have to obey them, right? Those are what God in himself, through his word, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And he said what? He said, for this is what? Right. Right? It's the right thing to do. And he says, if you do that, there are, it's not just asking you to do something. He said, there will be promise. There will be what? Rewards. How many of us like rewards? Okay. And what kind of reward did God say that he was going to give us if we obey our parents? Yes. We will go to heaven. That's the most important one. And we will be able to see God at the end. So that was what God promised. And he told us all those good stuff that if we do it, that we are going to get that reward. Then he went ahead in verse 10. Just like we mentioned when we go to the park and gave us what? Caution. He said, with all these promises, with all this thing I've told you, you have to protect it. And he said what? Put on the whole armor. Right? Just like uh, we have what? I want us to pay attention to this. Just like we have password on our phone to protect our phone, right? God said, because we have so much good stuff inside our phone, don't we? Our parents, of course. God said, because of all these promises, Satan will not be happy, right? You have to protect it. And how would we protect those good stuff that God has put in us? By, putting, by being what? Careful, right? In school, when somebody asks you to do something bad, what will you do? Shout it. You don't have to do it. Right? And when you do that, guess what? God himself will be happy. Right? God will be happy that you're obeying him. So today, what are you going out, young disciple, from this talk? Is that you have some good stuff in you. Right? Some important thing that God has put in you. And you have to protect it. Okay? Let us pray. Precious God, we thank you for these young ones. We pray that you preserve their life, protect them as they grow in Jesus' name. Let us pray together.
Lord Jesus, we are all blessed, each one of us here together today. For the gift of life, we are grateful. And please guide us to use that gift well, serving to make this world better, to brighten someone's day, and to let the light of the gospel flow and shine through us. We pray for all of our neighbors in need. And as Jesus taught, we remember that our neighbors includes everyone and no one is excluded. Lord, we live in a time, a culture and circumstance of deep divisions, harsh and angry perspectives. Please show us how to stand apart from that destruction by choosing to be peacemakers and reflectors of your grace, your mercy and compassion. May the ways that we choose to live and interact with other people be consistent with living into your kingdom and the promised eternal life that awaits us. We thank you for the many who serve and give freely toward our mission as a church. And may this be a good place to plug in and participate, a place to grow and develop our unique gifts and resources as your disciples. Help us be a people of affirmation, gratitude and encouragement, who notice and appreciate and welcome all whom you send our way. Please help us live in ways that are pleasing to you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your steadfast love and blessings. For those whose example and teaching has helped us recognize truth. For according to your desire to bless, you've placed people in our lives to influence us, to teach and mentor us. And through those relationships, to experience your steadfast love. We thank you for this church family. And may we be a faithful fellowship where your word is lived and proclaimed. And may we be open, eager, and welcoming to your call to serve. We pray for all who are hurt or in need this day. For those facing life's limitations and uncertainties, for the lonely and anxious, for the sick and grieving. Grant all of us your courage and strength for the trials and opportunities of our lives. We pray for families, that we will be gentle with one another and parents will help their children to find the true way. Lord, your creation is wonderful. And may we gratefully perceive your loving hand at work all around us. We pray that in this silence, in the very presence of your mercy, may we lay down before you all of our fear, anxiety, and disappointments. According to your will and grace, O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we do thank you that we are your beloved children. You are present with us. You are blessing our lives in ways beyond our understanding. Help us be sensitive. Help us respond well. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
has promised to lead us on our way. And we who love and worship God, our Maker, will listen to hear the Spirit say, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Chosen and beloved, you are my own. Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. By your name I called you for my Our first scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 10 through 14, 30 and 31. Here begins the reading. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone, and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and believed in the Lord, and in his servant Moses. Our second scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 and 23 and 24. Here begins the reading. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his power put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may stand, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As for shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, according to your wisdom, your goodness and grace, Open our lives to the transforming power of your word, our understanding to hear your word and no other. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable in our sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. One time in college, on the way back to my dorm after class, 
I took a shortcut across one of the athletic practice fields. Suddenly, a strange-looking ball sailed over my head, and when I looked back to see where it came from, a wild mob of fierce-looking rugby players were charging toward me, <laughs> shouting and rushing to get around and pass me after the ball. That rather frightening scene comes to mind when I read this story about Pharaoh's army coming after the Hebrew slaves from Egypt, trapping them against the sea with no place to go or escape. One of my Old Testament professors recommended that whenever we read an Old Testament story, we should try to drop ourselves into the action and try to imagine that experience and what they might have felt. Descended from several generations of Hebrew slaves in Egypt, the only life they had ever known was harsh, unpleasant, and enslaved. And so can you imagine what out of Egypt must have felt like for them? And then looking back off into the distance, they notice a huge cloud of dust coming toward them, and gradually they make out that it's Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit and they're probably not coming to play rugby. A most terrifying moment of fear and panic. And as they cry out, starting in verse 10, in great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? for it would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. In, in Exodus, reluctantly, Pharaoh had eventually allowed the Hebrew slaves to leave, and then he changed his mind and led with his chariots for, to bring them back. When the Israelites saw Pharaoh's army come in after them, they're terrified. There's no way they could fight against the Egyptians. They were trapped with the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army charging up quickly behind them. It was seemingly a hopeless and impossible situation. And they angrily blamed Moses for putting them at risk. Verse 13, but Moses responded with God's word and promised to deliver them. Do not be afraid, Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to keep still. The verses following this passage describe the sea parting for the Israelites to escape and walk to safety on dry land. When Pharaoh's army tried to follow in pursuit, the parted sea fell back onto them and drowned them. Jesus accomplished, or God accomplished, what the Israelites could not do for themselves. Notice, there's nothing about grab your weapons to defend yourselves. But the promise, the hope, and the assurance is that God has already got this. Those attacking you, you'll never see them after today. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to keep still. The victory wasn't something these people accomplished, but the victory was ent won entirely without their help. Verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel. That day from the Egyptians, and the Egyptian, Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. All through Scripture, we are reminded again and again that God's power promises an abiding presence, that these are sure and certain our pathway to victory. And that's also the same message from this Ephesians 6 passage. I was sitting with a seminary friend in his apartment one time, 
And one of his two little boys came charging out of the back bedroom, sobbing, Jacob hit me with a breastplate of righteousness. <laughs> and then Jacob came running out, also in tears, complaining, but dad, he hit me first with a sword of faith and the belt of truth. Noting my confused and quizzical look, Frank explained that the boy's grandmother had given each of them a plastic Ephesians 6 Armor of God playset. And they'd been fighting spiritual battles ever since. I'm pretty sure there's some questionable theology involved in this, along with some significant misunderstanding of put on the armor of God. The Christians in Ephesus were feeling discouraged and hopeless. They were facing severe persecution, the power and the might of Rome. For at that time, there was an intense and concerted effort to wipe out Christianity entirely by persecuting the church and the Christians. It was a very discouraging and difficult time for believers who were trying to be faithful in a very hostile pagan culture facing opposition from Rome while trying to proclaim the gospel. And for Paul, his situation was also difficult and disappointing. Instead of preaching, teaching, and proclaiming God's word, the apostle finds himself imprisoned in a dark, dank dungeon. So it's not looking very promising or hopeful for the apostle or for the church. And it's out of that sense of struggle and hopelessness of that situation, the absolute impossibility of fighting harder to win victory, that the true power, promise, and hope becomes crystal clear. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God. For our struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. In the Greek, the verb form of this be strong is a passive verb in middle voice, which is translated as be strong, but it might be a better translation, be made strong. See, it's not about us being strong by our own effort, but it's by the power of the Lord making us strong. It's prayer and faith as we cling to the strength of God's grace and love. And perhaps seeing a prison guard's armor led Paul to think about God's protection, which inspires a more faithful perspective of hope and optimism. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. The apostle recognizes and is proclaiming that we cannot possibly defeat evil on our own. It's only through God's gracious care, God's love and goodness, that we're protected and enabled to stand fast and persevere. And just as he sees these parts of the armor protecting God, Paul starts in verse 14. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Take the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the hamlet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Fasten the belt of truth around your waist. A Roman soldier wore a wide leather belt that held together all the other pieces of the armor, just as our Christian life is held together with God's truth. And the truth is that God loves us and seeks to bless us. And everything else about our faith and how we live builds on that truth of God's gracious love and purpose. It's all in a trusting response to God's grace, hope, and promise. It overcomes all our fear, disappointment, shame, defeat, and mistakes. Also overcoming our secret wounds and the scars we endure. 
For our Lord God does not want us to just bear all of that, but rather for us to allow the healing and cleansing power of of renewal, being open to the light of grace shining into all of our hidden darknesses and put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate was that important armor that covered the chest. But it's not our righteousness that protects us from harm. But rather, it is entirely God's righteousness that protects us, which we receive by grace through Jesus Christ. God's grace toward righteousness. That is our true protection. And take the sword of the shield of faith. Now, there were specific words in the Greek that refer and describe different kinds of shields. The particular one in this passage was a large rectangular leather shield that would be soaked in water before the battle so it could defend against the enemy's flaming arrows. And the frame of each of these shields would also interlock with the one next to it. And by placing all their shields together, the soldiers could form a wall or a shell that together protected them all from harm. Now, of course, we make an individual faith decision about responding to God's love and grace that's offered through Jesus Christ. But that faith decision to receive God's grace and healing also and simultaneously connects us by faith with all other believers, truly making us a part of this community of faith, the church, where we combine our shields of faith with others. Haven't we all had the experience of reaching the end of our rope or feeling defeated, weary, failing, and about ready to give up? And then God sends someone to encourage and uphold us, someone to hold their shield of faith beside us, to support us against the fiery arrows of distress and defeats in this world. And so it goes through all these pieces of armor that are mentioned. Now, it's not that we're to attack anyone or to fight on our own strength. For the battle isn't won on our own terms or by our hard work. There's always far more going on than we can perceive. Healing, helping, blessing, the limitless abundance of God's grace. And putting on the armor is putting our hope in Jesus Christ, uniting with Christ through the work and presence of the Holy Spirit so that God accomplishes his plan and his will in us and through us, something far beyond and above any outward appearance or expectation. So as we continue to face disappointments and unending challenges, As we work through ongoing uncertainties of these days, the way ahead won't always be clear, familiar, or easy, and we could very easily slip into overwhelming fear and panic. So our call is not to fight the battle by attacking evil on our own, but by seeking a growing and deepening relationship with God trying to discern and keep up with whatever God is doing. The victory happens when we are in alignment with God's will. Our call is to be no more and no less than who we truly are. Each of us created unique, loved and equipped to serve. Exactly as God graciously, deliberately and specifically created each of us. And by believing that the Lord, by trusting that the Lord will give us the courage, wisdom, and strength we need. And so it will be God who does the fighting for us. For in fact, our God has already got the path of victory laid out for us. It was just a few years ago, seemingly an easier time, that at the annual session retreat, we were discussing the growing threat and uncertainty of the spreading Wuhan virus. And the elders decided that they're gonna cancel our after worship fellowship until we knew more about it. 
That week at Salt and Light, I asked one of the parents who often posted videos of our Salt and Light music on, in, on Facebook, I asked her to record the whole worship service on her phone and then try posting it just in case. And the next week, everything got shut down. God had already been preparing us, and all through this COVID-19, we never once missed posting a worship service every week. And these, the commitment of these heroes got us all through this isolation. It was truly incredible how amazing, faithful, and dedicated people cooperated and somehow made all the details come together so well, far beyond the skills or knowledge we had when we began, because God put their specific gifts to work. I am totally and gratefully convinced that that was all God's doing, and though it looked pretty hopeless and discouraging. So these days, that remarkable and blessed experience helps remind me to pray, to trust and wait upon God, hopefully before I go into panic mode. I never want to forget that things are not always as they appear, that God may be up to something mysteriously and more wonderful that's way beyond my expectations or understanding. Sometimes when our problems seem most impossible, crushing and daunting, it turns out that God is most present, most in full control and at work, already accomplishing way more than we thought possible. Our battles and our struggles and problems as we read in Ephesians are not about flesh and blood, nor are they about defeating other people but is putting on the armor which we accomplish when we pray. And if we choose not to pray, then we're leaving that armor on the wall, God's gift. The defense and power is useless hanging on a wall. For my own prayer life in dealing with problems and challenges, some of the practical questions that I've learned to consider are these. What is the truth, the whole truth, and the truth I am not recognizing? What are some of the other perspectives that I'm not understanding? And how can I best glorify and honor God through all of this? How is this consistent with the God that I know and trust who loves me? And is there something more that God is trying to teach and reveal to me? We are promised throughout Scripture, but I want to read in particular from Lamentations and Ephesians. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Therefore, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert and always persevere. And that is the Word of God. Let us pray. We do thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love and grace. We thank you, Lord, that we are never beyond your love. We ask, Lord, you'd speak to each of us. Shine your light into our lives that we might see. Help us, Lord, to trust and stand in confidence in you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and join in hymn 3, or 838, Standing on the Promises.
And now may the love, the grace, the mercy, and peace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.